Good morning friends and welcome back to NPTEL online lecture on the course Indian Poetry in English. In the previous lecture, we had talked about a very strong and authentic Indian poet's voice that was of K. N. Daruwala. And today once again, we are going to talk about another major important authentic uh, modern voice, especially in terms of Indian poetry in English. And the voice is that of Sib K. Kumar. Now, before we go into uh, the details of Sib K. Kumar's works, let us try to find out who was Sib K. Kumar and uh, what sort of uh, poetic uh, corpus uh, did he have and what were the influences and uh, how do his poems talk about modernity. Sib K. Kumar uh, was born in Lahore in 1921. He actually was uh, from a strict uh, family uh, which maintained the discipline of Arya Samaj. Uh, and uh, he came from an orthodox Hindu family. Uh, but as Sib K. Kumar had uh, different opportunities to get himself educated, uh, he went to uh, some other country where he did his uh, a work on Bergson and uh, the stream of consciousness uh, novel. I mean, he was a Bergsonian scholar. Uh, it is always said that Sib K. Kumar was a late bloomer in terms of uh, his poetry writing because uh, he started writing poetry only after uh, his uh, 50th year. Most of the works that Sib K. Kumar uh, did or uh, most of the poems that he uh, composed uh, had different sorts of uh, images, different sorts of varieties that we will come across uh, because Sib K. Kumar uh, was uh, uh, not only a learned person, but he was actually a professor uh, in uh, Hyderabad uh, University. Uh, he had also the opportunity uh, to visit and to deliver his talks in many major universities of the world. Uh, and that is that is how the different sort of experiences that are found in Sib Kumar's uh, world of poetry have a different sort of tinge. My difference you remember well. Uh, that while discussing K and Darubala, uh, we had actually talked about how Darubala uh, brings the external realities of Indian poetry. Here in Sib K Kumar, this world will find that Sib K Kumar actually tries to delve deep into the internalities of may, man, and and then at times also we find uh, that Sib K Kumar celebrates a jest for life uh, through his poetry. Uh, we will come across uh, uh, several other themes uh, that actually have made Sib K Kumar Sib K Kumar. Sib K Kumar is actually Sib Krishna Kumar. Uh, he is a satiric rationalist. We can uh, call Sib K Kumar a realist, but as a realist, we can also find elements of uh, 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 satire in his poetry. Uh, his, his poetry is actually uh, full of love. Uh, there are different other uh, uh, themes also associated, themes uh, which in Indian context can be considered to be uh, taboo, but Sib K. Kumar has uh, taken it very courageously uh, in his uh, poetic uh, over. He was actually a post-colonial uh, imagist uh, poet. Uh, he has got a lot of works to his credit. He is not only a poet, but uh, uh, also a novelist, uh, a writer. I am an, a writer of short stories and then also a translator, uh, two of his uh, very famous novels also you might have come across. One of them is entitled Nude Before Gods uh, and the other is uh, about a bones prayer um, and uh, uh, then, uh, but then we will here confine ourselves to the poetic world of Sib K. Kumar. Uh, because Sib K. Kumar also had uh, several accolades uh, to his name. He also got awarded uh, Sahit Academy Award. Then there are some other awards also, namely uh, Padma Bhushan in 2001. He also wrote uh, some uh, plays and short stories as well. Uh, it was actually uh, in 1962, he converted his uh, PhD work into the form of a book entitled Bergson and the Stream of Consciousness uh, Novel. Uh, Sib K. Kumar breathed his last in the year 2017. I mean, uh, I mean recently, only uh, three or four years back, uh, Sib K. Kumar uh, bid adieu uh, to this mundane world. Uh, but then, what Sib K. Kumar did uh, through his poetic ventures are really very significant. 
he started uh, his uh, poetic career with articulate silences which came out in 1970 as i had already said that sipke kumar was a late bloomer in the world of poetry and uh, after articulate silences followed cobwebs in the sun uh, here one point of caution uh, to be maintained is let us have a look at the title of his uh, uh, poetic uh, volumes uh, which itself suggests uh, that Sipke Kumar was very close to the images and uh, when one reads and when one interprets and uh, has a journey uh, in his uh, poetic world, one can find the sort of images, the contrariness, the antagonism, the opposites and many other things available in his poetic world. So, cobwebs in the sun uh, and, and then came uh, subterfuges, then uh, followed by that came woodpeckers in 1979. Uh, then there appeared broken columns in 1984, then trap falls in the sky for which uh, Sipke Kumar was given Sahitya Academy Award in 1987, though the book was published in 1986. And then came Old Gathering in 1995 uh, and also came Thus Spake the Buddha in 2001. Uh, and uh, there is one more collection which we shall also discuss. As regards uh, his uh, poetic volumes, we can find uh, that while like many other poets, Sipke Kumar also believed in the notion that suffering is at the core of the genesis of poetry. So, one can find in his poetic volumes uh, suffering, suffering of all sorts, but Sipke Kumar is not confined only to one area of suffering. He also look at uh, poverty, he also looks at uh, uh, the ugliness. Uh, uh, and he also tries to find beauty in ugliness. Then there are some uh, many other sidedness in his poetry, which uh, really one can find a sort of Laurentian touches in his poetry because Sibke Kumar's uh, many uh, poems uh, are also soaked uh, in the celebration of body, where you know in an age uh, when we used to talk about uh, many ancient notions uh, uh, that body being a sac uh, sacred one, Sibke Kumar talks of it in a different manner and he delineates it. There is a sort of logical reasoning as well and then one can find a search for soul in majority of his poems. As regards uh, Sibke Kumar's volumes, we can find that articulate silences itself articulates his own silences then cobwebs in the shun uh, that is actually a delineation uh, and yearning for the beautiful things. Then came subterfuges which actually talks about the divinization and representation of femininity fine because Sipke Kumar uh, talks uh, to a great extent in majority of his poem uh, how the body behaves and how the body is ignored and then we also try to make a journey to the soul. So, how can we keep the body uh, you know longing and then thinking of the soul to have a sort of perfection all these notions one can come across when one uh, glosses over the works of Sipke Kumar. Uh, then comes uh, Ode Pickers uh, which uh, is a delineation of uh, death then trap falls in the sky for which he got Sahit Academy Award. Uh, this trap falls in the sky talks about human existence. Uh, on the other hand, wool gathering talks about the dreams, desires and fantasies because Sib Kumar uh, believes uh, that dreams and desire they actually not only correlate, but they cooperate and the suppression of desire is also a sort of negation of life which Sipke Kumar believed. Uh, here we can take uh, a one uh, a very famous uh, admission or confession of Sipke Kumar uh, because uh, Sipke Kumar since uh, he was very much influenced by uh, the western philosophy and uh, since he had spent majority of his life uh, uh, in uh, US and he also delivered talks in various uh, other foreign universities. So, Sipke Kumar is very much, in, very much influenced by western ideas, but then what he himself says is because there is an element of confession in his uh, poetry also. Uh, he has uh, said in tone and structure my poetry may be autobiographical, but the readers fail to comprehend that a poet often invents facts and experiences camouflaging them as real and authentic to achieve the reader's total participation, total participation. Uh, Sibke Kumar may not be as uh, socially committed 
as uh, Darubala, but when we find uh, Sipke Kumar's uh, major works which are uh, soaked in love, sex and marriages, then we find that Sipke Kumar is very close to the internal realities of uh, mankind. Uh, so, uh, we, we can uh, also take uh, some of his poems, but before that let us also try to find out the characteristic features of his poems. Sipke Kumar uh, blends in his own poetry a sort of uh, uh, confessional mode and uh, satiric uh, comments uh, spread here and there. Uh, the images uh, that he uses, it is said that uh, Sibke Kumar uh, sexualizes uh, Indian landscapes. One can find that when one comes across uh, reading some of the poems like Kovalam Beaches uh, and then when he talks about uh, uh, the flora and fauna also, he talks about mango orchard also, then there he talks about uh, a virgin uh, with some sort of uh, swollen, uh, swollen uh, breasts and all. So, in all the uh, poems of uh, Sebke Kumar which are specially uh, focused uh, on women, we can also find that Sebke Kumar tries to bring out which could have been considered very taboo uh, as uh, uh, traditional uh, Indian, but that was not because uh, Sebke Kumar came appeared uh, on Indian literary scene when uh, two world wars had already been over and he was uh, very much influenced by uh, several modernist poets like Ajara Pound and T.S. Eliot and all and we can find the vestiges of it uh, throughout his poetry. We can also come across the torches of a modern world in Sivke Kumar's world. Uh, or when one comes across uh, the depiction of reality, we find how uh, the distorted reality uh, we are living around. At times, uh, the sort of lines that he creates may not rhyme, but there is a musicality in terms of the thought. Uh, so, one can also find uh, some uh, images uh, of uh, dance love poetry, uh, but here in Sib Kumar, uh, we can find that the lines are very short. Uh, they are not didactic, uh, but they reason and they mean also. Uh, there, is, there is a plenty of uh, wit, irony and sophistication in his poetry. Uh, sexual representation for which he has been criticized a lot also. Many people often say that uh, he was anti-woman, but he was not. Uh, that we will see when we read uh, some of his poems. Uh, of course, several offshoots of modern life are visible in the poetic world of Sebke Kumar, like domestic crisis, breakup of marriages, uh, then the two people appearing to be uh, very much united, but how separated they are. Uh, so, how broken relationships are, uh, are found uh, in and around uh, our own surrounding, one can have uh, a picture of it uh, through his poetry. Sebke Kumar actually laughs even when uh, there are situations of odds. He actually tries to see beauty even when there is ugliness. He tries to find out uh, beauty even when there is uh, poverty. And as a poet, as he himself mentions uh, that he actually wants his readers to participate uh, in uh, the process of poetry because he believes like John Keats uh, that a poem should come naturally as the leaves come to a plant. So, uh, even, even though he has uh, talked about uh, several issues, uh, but uh, majority of his poems are uh, um, uh, confined uh, to the women's world. Of course, uh, death also has been a perennial theme in his poetry. Uh, in many of his poems, he talks of the uh, death where uh, many people have also gone to the extent of say, uh, saying that it is actually colored by his personal crisis and all. So, we shall be taking some of the poems in order to make our point uh, verified and justified. For example, here is one poem entitled Married Too Long. Let us look at the lines and then you will find uh, that how he believes because Sibke Kumar is a poet of immediate change uh, that can be said. He does not believe uh, in much of the traditionality uh, even though while he was spending his life uh, outside, I mean outside the country, he felt uh, that he really was fed up uh, with the darkness there. But then he also, in India also he talks about uh, certain traditions and certain norms uh, which appear to be very aweary and which appear to be very outdated. But then as a poet, he cannot control himself and uh, says things which are soaked in reality. Uh, let us look at the lines. Married too long, 
One by one, the stars have faded from your face. See the image. The stars have faded from your face. Now you loom large between doors, a dropping gray sky. For me to walk through, we wear each other like soiled underwear. Now see how he talks about how the passing of the days also have uh, got a sort of effect on our relationship. And then here the poet actually yearns for a sort of newness. I see you hang on every wall like an obituary, like an obituary of our first spring when doves mated under flurried wings. So there is a, a depiction of the memory of the days that are gone by. And then on every windowsill, now let me entomb you in a glide frame, stand you on the mantelpiece below my grandfather's cuckoo, clock to hoot down early, our routine loves till death do not, do not, uh, till death do not us apart. Now, uh, here is one thing to be noticed uh, that according to the Indian notion and tradition, we find that uh, once uh, uh, marriage is solemnized, it is an everlasting bond. But then the poet actually tries to find out and steal away some moments where he says uh, that of all traditions, we should also try to find out uh, if the relationships are going to stand for a long time. Is the age not going to have its own imprint also on the relationship? So there is uh, a, a sort of uh, uh, thinking, a sort of pondering even on relationships. We can also find uh, in some other poems. Uh, but before that, let us also have a sort of analysis of the poem where we find that love and life, these are actually two things. Uh, I am actually reminded of one very important uh, poem which is entitled Broken Columns where the poet appears to be very autobiographical. We will come to that where he says that how our forefathers have been telling us all wise sayings and uh, providing us with moral lectures but they try, they actually fail to understand the splits and the gaps that are there in the mind uh, and in the psyche of a growing up boy who is actually uh, said, who is, who is actually asked, the growing boy is asked uh, uh, to feed on, to actually the growing boy is asked to feed on uh, the more relations. But then as the boy grows, the boy also should, uh, the boy's forefathers or his grandparents should also understand the realities of the growing boy. That is not how long can we uh, do that. So, we will we'll come to that. Now, in the, in the modern uh, day world, I mean we cannot remain unaffected uh, by our surroundings, what happens around ourselves in our surroundings and of course one can also find uh, the imprint of a sort of crisis after the two worlds, world wars have been over and uh, mankind uh, is oscillating uh, between conflict and resolution and all and there are several things that can be done and that can also be undone. And in this, there is also a possibility of the failure of love and marriage. Relationship which we consider to be so permanent, eternal uh, can also uh, yearn for a sort of change, fine. One cannot always uh, be considered to stick to one relationship with the changing times. Uh, with days, romance becomes dead and forgotten. The ugly human experience cannot be relegated, rather they are also to be brought onto the paper and as, as man realizes uh, that everyday realities are also changing. Of course, uh, the poet at times becomes very uh, satirical, uh, but then we cannot deny uh, that with changing times, uh, our psyche, our spirit, our mind, our notions, our practices also can undergo a change. It is here uh, a worth mentioning quote uh, to be made mention of. Uh, because uh, Kumar has often been described as a poet who has always uh, negatively uh, deliberated upon uh, women. So, Kumar sees women not as an object of beauty, but sees the ugliness, dirt and disease associated with life. But then this is actually a negative reason running counter to the romantic glorification of women. Now, Kumar has a point to prove here that women 
always cannot be glorified. No, you only make her a sort of idol or a piece of beauty or whatsoever. But then we should also try to understand their inner feelings, what they really want. And we will find in some other poems as well that when marriage is celebrated uh, between the two parties, the bride and the groom, the bride is supposedly a very submissive creature and never are her notions being understood nor her feelings. So, what Kumar actually advocates is that they should also have a sort of freedom, they also vouch for a freedom, they also yearn for a freedom and that they should be provided with. We can also take uh, uh, another uh, poem because uh, uh, Sibke Kumar uh, uh, often at times we find that Sibke Kumar often also uh, paints the landscapes in his poetry, po poet, poetic world. Here is a poem entitled at a psychedelic art exhibition. I may not be able to read the entire poem, but you can uh, read it at your own leisure. But I will uh, simply read some of the lines which are very important from the point of view of Sibke Kumar being a poet of landscape. The cat's retina, it is about an art exhibition. The cat's retina cannot hold the fish, bowl for the fins, amber, crimson, hectic red are balls of fire dancing around a vacuity. We will come across such uh, images, vacuity, emptiness, fine. And then we will also find the motile pattern of the Damascus carpet steps out of its bounds to flow over. I mean, captivity wants to get a sort of a uh, real flow into the bare flow. The sunset broods over the insidious violence of San Francisco. The men in the pavement pubs drinking from Leviathan tankards will soon roll down to the slopes. And then again the poet becomes conscious. And here we find on the front wall the Buddha's eyes shaken out of potty quietitude blink hysterically under the throbbing neon lights and the percussive music that lead us down to the dark hollows of the snake pit. Let us walk. Now, now, now are the concluding lines. Let us walk through this canvas to the room's end where the crocodiles are meditating, where the crocodiles are meditating. Now, see he also brings in uh, the images of the snakes, the crocodiles, the animals and others. So, one can find a sort of impressionity picture of the art exhibition. So, Sibke Kumar's uh, poetic uh, canvas has a different sort of pattern, pattern of all colors, of all tinges. Uh, there are, there are imprints of abstraction. Of course, there is an element of satire in majority of his poems. Sibke Kumar actually believed uh, that poetry is a spontaneous discovery. Discovery of what? Of the imagination about one or another aspect of reality. It is not only about ima imagination, but also about realization. And this realization in different forms have to come and humans have to face. Uh, Sibke Kumar's world is uh, not bereft of uh, the uh, abstraction, it is not bereft of the fragmentation, uh, squalor, crassness of the modern commercial world, especially in the West. That is why in many poems you can uh, come across uh, the uh, impression of uh, T. S. Eliot's uh, wasteland, uh, the way uh, uh, T. S. Eliot also makes a mention of how uh, there is nothingness all around and relationships simply are, are just like people wearing masks. And uh, uh, Sipke Kumar also mentions in one poem that uh, I am reminded of, it is about a marriage party where everyone, everyone except the bride, they are happy. They are celebrating a sort of happiness. But this happiness, the poet says, is only a sort of masked happiness where the bride's feelings are not taken into consideration, but everyone simply wears a sort of happiness. We will come to that. There is another poem named Insomnia, where we can find how, you know, uh, the poet or for that matter the creator or for that matter the maker is always at unrest. This poem can be interpreted into um, uh, various ways, one can have uh, different, uh, you know, interpretations of this poem. But this poem especially talks about insomnia, sleeplessness, 
which is actually a modern day problem you know uh, or a, a person is not able to sleep and when he is not able to sleep what sort of thoughts actually bombard his mind and how he is transported to a new world but again he is uh, you know anguished and he is uh, in a state of sorrow that once again he will have to face another uh, night where he is not able to sleep. Let us have a look at the poem and uh, through some of the lines uh, we can also interpret. My wife snores, you see what, what a sort of uh, life a modern man is uh, living in or experiencing rather. My wife snores, my son's dream. Fingers have reached the sideboard's top cell for Cadbury. So, the wife and the children uh, or the son, uh, they are sleeping, but the poet, the persona is uh, not yet sleep, he does not feel like sleeping. So, my son's dream fingers have reached the sideboard's top cell for Cadbury. The sky grins through a handful of stars while I hold the defiant pills in my torpid hand. So, restlessness, but then we actually have to take the pills to invite sleep. I am a double agent. I will drag my watch dog to burgle my own house. And, and he says, I will uh, drag my watch dog to burgle my own house. I know where my wife's secret lie sealed. Each night I hear the same tattoo in my skull's chamber. I have counted all the stars when the persona is not able to sleep. What the poet does? The poet says, I have counted all the stars over my terrace. The steel bars in my neighbor's balcony are 21 and the three suburban freight trains rumble past the rail crossing between 2 and 4. So, it is here a state of and, and this is actually the effect of the modern ways of life. Where darkness now snaps at the seams, a hymn floats across the sky like a bird's wobble and somewhere down the lane a hand pump creaks the milkman's bottle jingles at my doorsteps. So, it, it is actually a world where even the pills are not able to induce sleep in me and the poet has been sleepless throughout the night and he is not able to sleep and the down comes, no? the coming of the down and it is, it is uh, being indicated to the poet by the jingles of the milkman who is uh, coming with his bottles and then also uh, the uh, creaking voice of the hand pump, so the arrival of a new down. It, uh, it can also be interpreted philosophically uh, that while I am struggling, while I am in a moment of conflict, the down begins. But then at the physical level, we can find uh, the poet to be in a state of sleeplessness. And then he says, no, every day, you know, this is actually a routine affair. I must walk through the day's fire to let another moon demolish me. So, it has now become an everyday habit that I am not able to sleep and again I am waiting for another moon, another night rather which will demolish my sleep, is not it? So, now I, we, are, we can be reminded of and what shall we do, fine? If, if we are reminded of the wasteland, uh, there is uh, one line and what shall we, the game of chess, you know, the game of chess and then uh, a closed car at 4. I mean, he talks about how every day passes, every night passes, but the poet as a thinker, the poet as a creator is not able to have a sort of sleep, but then time does not stop. Time is in a flux, it is changing my difference. So, we can here find uh, that as an effect of uh, the modern day life, sleeplessness has become a part and parcel, is not it? Modern man is always restless because he is always waiting for his own goal. We have become so much goal oriented that we are in the midst of a set of views, my dear friend. We are always having a sort of deceit in order to have a sort of aim, uh, aim fulfilled, fine. So, as I, as I uh, said, 
that we can hear several voices, we can hear several uh, echoes from T. S. Eliot's Westland because the poet was highly influenced by many western poets. At the same time, one can also notice a sort of consciousness, the knowing consciousness of the soul's disquietude as a one uh, critic has gone to the extent of saying that it is not only a common sleeplessness, rather it is a sort of soul's disquietude my dear friend. Bruce King in his uh, poet has uh, rightly mentioned uh, that Kumar's poetry uh, seems to be immediate, immediate as if written at nerve end and, the, and in the heat of a with still and the heat of or with still vivid memories of conflict. So, this is actually the modern man's crisis. Kumar's poem may appear to be very angry at times, very angry moods you can find uh, and, and at times you can also find that there is a sort of uh, passivity, there is a sort of repression also, but then uh, as a poet it is his task to bring out all these passivities and all these uh, repressions because these are some such things which can be understood only internally, not the external realities as we have uh, mentioned and discussed uh, while we were discussing uh, K. N. Darubala. As I was mentioning uh, about one very important uh, uh, poem, poetry collection named uh, Broken Columns, uh, this Broken Columns you will find that as a poet even though Sibke Kumar as a poet may appear to be rebellion, but in broken columns through 12 poems, it is actually a sequence of 12 poems, the poet actually presents to us the becoming of or the growth of a child from the child to the man to the artist as uh, you know we, we can uh, think of a sort of uh, the image of the building stroma how a man becomes, how a child grows into a man, then he becomes an aesthete or an artist. So, here in these 12 sequence of poems also we can find uh, there are different stages uh, where you know where uh, the uh, poet, there is an interaction between the uh, child, child who is the poet and the father which who actually can be understood as a sort of uh, traditional mores and as a sort of dictat that uh, is uh, being followed and maintained in our society every now and then. So, this broken columns may appear to be very autobiographical where we find that as a child you have a fancy for several images as a young boy growing into a young man how your fancies, your attractions, your fascinations for a girl whereas uh, the adult world will tell you no this is not proper fine, uh, this is not proper why because uh, they will they will always uh, tell you. Uh, that you have to maintain the order and the decorum. So, these conflicts we can find and then how when uh, time is ripe for uh, the young man to get married. So, this is actually the traditional uh, uh, practices being followed, but the poet is in conflict, the poet is actually struggling for a sort of existence. Uh, here in this uh, um, poem entitled Broken Columns, uh, the poet Sibke Kumar also laughs or takes a dig at the particularities of Indian Hindu life. I will uh, only take uh, some of the lines in order to make my point very clear. Uh, at 10 I play hide and seek, this is the third stage. Uh, like the seven ages of may, man, but here Sibke Kumar uh, talks of uh, 12 uh, poems and in 12 poems he talks about the different stages and he says, at 10 I play hide and seek down the school lane in a shop stacked with teak and devdar and suddenly sila checkered skirt blows into life, a child's fascination or attraction for a girl, but then society own permit because there is order there are dictates and then he says, I transfix her behind a pillar of Devdar and my lips release the tongue to plumb the Bay of Bengal. And then what he says towards the end is uh, very significant, is there a point, now the poet interrogates also and in uh, the poet's interrogation are many questions, questions that actually interrogate uh, the uh, traditions which are a part and parcel of Indian life. Is there a point at which even the parallel lines meet 
out of sheer exhaustion. So, can these traditions be broken and, and, and then uh, the poet will further uh, mention how uh, when it is time he is married and then he may have children and then he may have a, a, a sort of disillusionment with the world and then he may think of uh, he may yearn for a change and all. So, this is all and, and you know and all these things even though they are uh, in truth, but then they are actually part of the practice and the poet actually uh, tries to make a search for uh, the soul's question for the interrogation of the soul. So, uh, Bruce King has uh, rightly mentioned because when the poet makes such interrogations, he also tries to laugh and you know in one poem he says, uh, the poem is entitled Kali where he says, if to create is to kill if to create is to kill. Now, you see, you look at the sort of contraries because uh, we talk of Kali and then we talk of the different avatars and, and then we talk because he actually laughs at the superstitious beliefs which are prevalent in Indian society. Kumar's poems as Bruce King says for all their wit and humor are angry, look at the lines, satiric responses to an India of passivity. In love, we have been practicing this passivity. Sexual rep repression, uh, Bruce King also goes to the extent of saying that uh, Kumar is sexualizing Indian landscapes, as in Kobalam Beach, we can find political hypocrisy. There are also uh, mentions of political hypocrisy and over glorified crumpling past. Crumpling past. Uh, now, as I have been saying that Kumar actually tries to laugh even out of oddities, he has also his eye for the minor details of common Indian scenes and themes. Here is a poem entitled An Indian Mango Vendor. If you look at the lines, here it is a common sight one can come across uh, that a mango vendor. Uh, maybe sometimes a girl, maybe also a mango vendor, how she is selling. She is actually uh, poor, uh, but then the person, I mean the buyer, what the buyer uh, is looking at, that is actually a depiction if you look at it. But then the poet actually tries to not only neutralize poverty, but also tries to find beauty even amid poverty. She squats on the dust broomed pavement behind a pyramid of mangoes. Look at the images behind a pyramid of mangoes, washed with her youth's milk. I mean, on the one hand, the poet admires that even though this young vendor is poor, tinctured, tinctured with a musk rouge in her hair. And now, the onlooker, the buyer. Through the slits of her patched plouch, one bare shoulder, two bright moons pull all horses off the track. Look at the images, horses, moons, I mean you can understand uh, the reference there. But here the poet actually tries to find out how even we can find beauty amid poverty, beauty amid ugliness. So, as a poet, Sibke, he is not anti a women as many people have charged him with, but he actually is a poet of intuition, a poet of impression who can find, who has his eye for details even among common subjects. Now, uh, there is uh, another work by Sibke Kumar entitled uh, From Wool Gathering, From Wool Gathering, fine. And uh, here again uh, one can find that how the poet actually tries to rebel against the tradition. It is about an Indian woman going to be married and uh, this uh, marriage is fine. Uh, in Indian system, it is so that a bride is married to a groom uh, based on the social conditions and all and the bride is supposed to be a silent creature who has got no right to open her veil tongue. But here, if we look at the lines, the poet actually tries to put some voice in the throat or in the lips of uh, the lady and uh, the lady says, this, this poem is uh, uh, 
uh, from first night after a dowried wedding. Dowry is a common feature in Indian marriages where the women are considered uh, to bring a dowry from their father's house. And then when the marriage is over, now look at uh, the way the woman says. But before you satter this vase, vase, so vase here is a symbol and this vase is the lady. Won't you join in my prayer for a while? I would then swallow your words for ritual sake. It will be easier for me to jump on the, fla on the flaming pyre. Now, by saying this, what the poet actually tries to convey is that these creatures, especially these women who are married as dumb creatures, they also should have their own feelings and which can be understood. Because in olden days, as you remember, when the women were uh, buried, uh, if they, they lost their husband. So, she is also taking a dig that it is very easy for me to jump on the flaming pyre, but should my feelings not be understood, should my feelings not be considered, that is actually the question. My dear friend, uh, in Sib Kumar, Sibke Kumar's world, one can find that the poet actually uh, appears at times to be anti-human, but he is not anti-human. The poet actually tries to purge mankind of this reality of having silenced women for ages. I mean, every individual may have dreams and desires and fantasies and uh, they ought to be heard. It is not only that women are simply meant to be uh, the pieces uh, of uh, surrender and stone, fine. So, at in many poems he has said that uh, we are actually worshipping the stones, but we are actually leaving the human beings. You can also find that there are poems which are, uh, um, which are composed after, you know, Khajuraho and others, where the poet actually tries to say that if you simply feel uh, that these are stoned, but then there are also intuitions uh, of union between man and woman and that can also be there, but how? only when the two can understand each other. The union of two souls, they actually matter much. Love is a force and love is a force that actually has got to bring two people together and that only can bring happiness. Women should not be considered only a thing, rather they should also be considered a sort of entity, fine and a love is actually such a force that requires attachment and not detachment. It uh, has been for ages been considered that they are simply things and uh, they are things just like toys uh, utilized and being thrown. But then a woman's feelings are as important as a man's and that is what this poem first night after a dowried wedding. I am also reminded of another uh, line because the poet uh, may be straightforward, but what he says is not devoid of truth. As he says in one of his poems uh, that a man should come to his woman whole, not when the mind is a perverted sunflower turning to darkness, fine. So, meaning thereby there should be a complete dedication, there should be a complete devotion this should be complete love and this love should be from both the parties, there should be a complete union and this union of feelings between the two. At, in, in, in some of the poems, he says, uh, loving you is uh, like uh, loving uh, an ice, loving an ice, loving a treacherous ice. So, there he refers to the coldness, but then one has to understand the reason behind uh, this coldness. My dear friends, uh, Sib K. Kumar has often been criticized for his anti-women women views, but then we can defend him if we find some of the lines from one of his famous collections entitled Losing My Way, where the poet actually makes God a witness and then he puts voice into the throat of the woman where he says, look at this woman you created out of me, a marvel, isn't she? A symphony of design and aroma, a rose bush grown out of my ribs seedling, temptation even for your angels to deny you, at least for a night. Was it a sin if I pressed her to my bosom? Maybe I was just reclaiming my lost rib. So, those who say 
that Sibke Kumar was anti-woman can get a lot of food for thought in these lines from Sibke Kumar's Losing My Way. Now, having discussed, because it is very difficult uh, to discuss the entire corpus of Sibke Kumar's poem, but I have tried my level best to familiarize uh, my listeners and readers to the world of Sibke Kumar, where there are uh, gems, no? where there are gems in every stone. Uh, in every stone, why I say? Because he has at times said uh, that these gods and goddesses, uh, they are you know, like stone gods, but then uh, he also depicts Mother Teresa's sacrifice and all. Actually, he tries to say that man is more important, human beings are more important. These superstitious beliefs are only man-made and we need to come out of it. That is Sibke Kumar's wish as a poet. So, uh, before we conclude, uh, we can draw out some findings. Kumar is actually a modernist and he has rightly been uh, called a romantic modernist by uh, Mohanty. Sesib K. Kumar blends confessional mode and ironic comments in his poems. He is actually his poetic world uh, though full of common subjects. There are many common subjects. It is Sivke Kumar's world where you can find all sorts of people being discussed, all sorts of people uh, being, uh, you know, pictured. It, his world comprises contraries, create, kill. I mean, there are end number of such uh, contraries you can come across. Antagonism and paradoxes with touches of intellectual reasoning. It is often said that since Sivke Kumar was a professor, uh, naturally, uh, there can be some intellectual sweeps of imagination, but that is not devoid of reality. His poetry aims to celebrate life by coming out of superstitious beliefs, superstitious beliefs and failures which deny mankind the joy and satisfaction because of human inadequacies. Human inadequacies, we have in us the power we have in us the adequacies and these adequacies have to be exploited, these adequacies have to be exposed in order to enjoy uh, the beauty and the benignity of life, my dear friend. Uh, if, if we remember well uh, the way we talked about uh, uh, mango vendor, we can also find out how in, in uh, one poem Sibke Kumar talks about women who are like empty pitchers waiting for their men to come because they have to be guarded and they cannot draw sketches on the walls, fine. I mean why and Sibke Kumar really when he is considered to be a rebellion is only because of the fact that he raises some valid questions whose answers can be understood once one takes a leap in the poetic world of Sibke Kumar. Kumar is of the view that human spirit must strive against mundane boundaries. My dear friends, those people who believe that Sibke Kumar uh, is uh, an anti-woman should understand that man and woman maintain a relationship. And this relationship is not only romantic, but this relationship is religious also, my dear friend. So with this, we come to the end of the talk, but before that, let me quote one line from Subterfuse where the poet says, beyond the priest's monotone, because in Indian culture priest is very important. And if you read uh, uh, Broken Columns where the son is suggested to visit the priest in the temple and when the son goes to visit the priest in the simple, uh, temple, uh, the priest actually tries to sensualize or to make some such comments or create some such atmosphere which cannot be considered to be religious, my dear friend. So, beyond the priest's monotone, a lamb bleeds for the knife edge. Here there is a dig on how human, uh, animals are being sacrificed in the name of religion and all. A child clinging to famished nipples will die anyway, but your nectar is the blood. Your nectar is the blood. How can a god uh, take uh, the blood of other uh, living beings as the nectar that jests from fresh arteries? So, how can the blood that comes out of living beings, how can be considered uh, a nectar or an amrit? But then our Indian cultural beliefs which are based on several superstitions they are 
in every age been proclaiming that the sacrifice in the uh, temples is often considered to be sacrosanct. But my dear friends, nothing can be as sacrosanct as life. A life has to be celebrated. One has to move beyond the boundaries in order to have a jest for life, in order to make life a sort of celebration, in order to make life a sort of impression that as human beings we are here to enjoy because life is meant to be very short-lived and one has to live but not at the cost of others. Thank you very much. With this, we come to the end of this lecture. I wish you all a very good night. Thank you.